As the so-called NA shuffle goes on in Counter-Strike Global Offensive, I've noticed kind of a growing trend, something I've noticed over the last six to about yeah, six to seven months, but get but getting more and more uh, kind of agreed upon, growing in, in popularity, is this set of opinions that not only suggests that like Hiko's overrated, he's not that good, like why do people keep talking about him as a good player? And also kind of the, the notion that his stock has dropped so low that he's like fucked up his career or he made the wrong choices or he's selfish and he's arrogant and he looks down on the other NA players. He thinks he's better than them and why won't he just join a team? And first and foremost, I think a lot of this stems from kind of a place where the way people view these roster moves is almost like a soap opera where they know the characters and they want to see this character get with that character. And, you know, if someone it won't be part of the storyline, essentially, won't get involved in being, being a team now, then they're the kind of, I, I think, unfairly treated as if, like, they're idiots or they're arrogant. And, you know, they should just get on now and just pick a team, whatever team's available now that seems like the best one, just pick that, sign up, start playing, and then play. And then, you know, maybe things will get better and you'll win a tournament and you'll go from there. And maybe you get a better player in and it builds up like that. It's quite a naive, actually, almost immature, I'd say, to some degree, kind of childish way of viewing it, actually. Because here's, here's my perspective on Hiko and his time in Cloud9. Because I think Hiko has been right in nearly all the decisions he's made. As in to leave Cloud9, to try and make an NA super team with the iBad Power players, then to align himself with Skadoodle and try and make it a package deal and make the best team he could out of that. Maybe to even consider foreign options, maybe look at the options of going to Europe instead. And now currently, not to have actually bedded down with the first team that he could, but still to be assessing his options. And so I'll go through all of this. In terms of where he was in Cloud9, before we talk about him leaving, we have to look at his time within Cloud9. Now, back in the days when they were complexity and they, they barely got any salary, if anything, they could only go to ESEA lands and then, what, two or three European lands a year. It was going to be a miracle for them to get even to the final of a tournament. And it never happened in terms of the international European tournaments. Now, they made the top four at DreamHack once, but that is, was in part due to a really good best of one upset win over Very Games, leading into a round of eight series against a team, Astana Dragons, who actually, if you chart their directory, that was when they were gradually going downhill from being a great team. And so all of this combined got them to a semi, but it wasn't like the hardest run to a semi, and it wasn't the best possible run where you proved that you were top four by making it there. It was a great Cinderella run, but then it got stopped Cinderella style with things collapsing completely against Fnatic. Beyond that, the real best run and the best ever period for Cloud9 was not that, which was their best ever tournament placing in terms of a big, big scale tournament, that semi at the first major, Dreamhack went to 2013. Their best ever run was actually the round of eight finish at ESL One Cologne in August of 2014. Now you have to understand the context here. When they made the round of eight of ESL One, EMS One Katowice in March of 2014, that was where they got there, but they had to face Nip, who's a top two team in the world. They only got there by some mildly miraculous play in terms of um, getting a really nice group for them. Actually, they didn't have a group that was any particularly beastly teams, so they had a chance to get out of it. And once they got out, they they had the chance to play against Nip. And okay, they, they got about the best they could hope for, which is they got a Dust 2 win with Swag going crazy, winning that crazy 1v4, just dropping a, an insane amount. And even then, even get onto a map they like, Nuke, etc., you know, about everything that could go right went right in terms of having what's a realistic performance and they still got stopped in round of eight and that was a pretty legitimate stoppage. Like, they weren't going to go further than that. So, I don't really count that as like, oh, they could have gone further and they should have gone... No, that was that was reasonable they got eliminated there. The bad one was in Cologne. So, like, six months later, well, five months later. Because in this one, okay, yes, they had a little bit of fortuitous play in the group stage. Like, they had, obviously, the overtime game against Titan and the close game against Dignitas. It took some miracle plays and some great individual plays, but that wasn't like those teams were super far above them. Some of those teams were better and were better overall, but these were just good performances that led into a round of eight. Now in the round of eight, here's the key part. So you, again, you had some good play in the group to get you there, but now in the round of eight, you really proved actually that in some ways you were the better team. 
you might, you might not have played better on specific rounds within the map. It's not even that on, that on maps you didn't play better. It's on specific rounds that really cost them. They didn't play better than Nip, even though in terms of at that tournament, they were actually a better team than Nip who won the tournament. But Nip managed to grind out these crazy rounds and get these amazing wins through legendary play of their own. And being one of the great all-time teams in terms of synergy, even when some of their players weren't on point of, in terms of performance level we know Nip were capable of. So in some senses, Cloud9, in many other days, if you replayed that same series, would win that series. Maybe even win two in two maps. Win in three, certainly. And then they'd go, and hey, if, if the random generator doesn't bring out Cobblestone, I think they win on nearly every other map there, actually. Maybe even comfortably on some of them. So then they'd go into a semi-final against LDLC. Now, LDLC, very tactical team. Not the most skilled team, but some good players. I think that it would have been doable to beat them in terms of the map matchup as well. I think there were some decent maps in terms of overlap of what they would like to play. So that's a reasonable one. I'd give them like either even odds or maybe a slight favourite to C9 there, 60-40. So then that puts them into a final, which would have been by far their best playing. It would have been by far the best pl um, placing of any NA team ever. Because even IBI Power's great win at ESEA land, that's, that's not the same as a major. Even their final at Face It, that, that, yeah, it's a very good tournament with stacked teams, but that's still not quite the same as the prestige of a major also making a final. So that team really did have that capability. But again, that also, remember, required things that didn't happen. It would have required a bit of fortuitousness, the right map here, then a good matchup against LDLC. We're still requiring a lot just to get to a final. This isn't even to win a major yet. It isn't even to win a tournament. So that's the best ever period. And this is when they had Shroud in the team and he was playing phenomenally in his first big event. But what happened after that? Shroud cooled the fuck off. Face it, he was still pretty decent. Then the next couple of lands, as well as all of the team in, well, as well as all of Cloud9 having a poor run after that in the European lands, he particularly, Shroud, kind of really fell off a bit. And it took him a while to regain his position and get his, his, his kind of status back in the team. In fact, I think Hiko leaving the team was part of kind of what somehow reignited Shroud, whether it was in terms of his form. It might not have been connected, but in terms of the timing, this, this is kind of when it happened. At the time, nothing was really struggling. He was having a lot of problems, even just fragging. Esquez, his orping went from being like good utility orping to he'd, he'd be trying to use it almost op v op battles and it wasn't working out well for him. Semphis was having his own issues. Everyone in the team, Hiko himself started to play badly in the period after that. For those couple of European lands, his level, he wasn't this super consistent beast that he had been for the majority of the period before, where before he had been the best player in the team. In terms of consistent skills, consistent performance, statistically even, game impact, he was right up there. Yes, Swag every now and then could have better games with him because he could be more explosive. He could win clutches. Nothing could have the odd map, like one out of five maps where he'd go crazy, but then the others, he wouldn't even be close to Hiko's consistency. Shroud came in with the sick aim, but Shroud's players... Shroud's players passive in a different sense where it's almost like I feel like Shroud is at his best when he's against other players who might be skilled, but they just make more mistakes. And his style is like a little bit more passive. And it's more like if they make a couple of mistakes, he'll 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 be he's opportunistic. Okay, he'll make the most of those mistakes. But he's not the kind of guy who forces the action and creates all the plays. Like we're talking about against top level competition here. We can't talk about against like a fifth best NA team. It has to be against top Europeans. We're always using as the rubric and the metric as to how good these players are. Okay, because the goal here is to become the best NA team and to become the one of the best teams in the world, not just the best than 18. That's the mentality that kept teams like C9 back in the dark ages co contextualized to Europe. So it was the right decision to leave because the results were not good and those lineups were not going to work. And so what's the option? Well, you have to change the lineup. So we've tried everything. We've tried changing Senfis to Sean Gares, Senfis to Sean Gares back to Senfis. We've tried doing different styles. We've tried changing Nothing's role to this one, this one. And I've tried changing it to another one. We've tried changing up the tactics, the tempo, the maps that we're playing on. Nothing's working. You can't find one map that you know you're going to win. You can't find two maps in a series that you're going to beat a better European team on in a best of three. They, they had this huge problem in Cloud9 at the time where they had good terrorist tactics and they'd have good scrimmy strats that would work every now and then so they could get terrorist rounds, but then somewhat reminiscent of Titan now, they could get more than the, the odds of terrorist rounds well, you shoot on that map in terms of the natural bias, but then you couldn't win because when you hit the CT side and you didn't have enough skill and you couldn't actually match up individually against the other teams and you couldn't put up a defense that could get enough CT rounds. So on maps like Inferno and Cash that you say you love, they could get the odd win on Cash, but they weren't going to be most of the top teams on it. On Inferno, they had a terrible time trying to work out CT sides on that, even though they had good terrorist tactics. That's a nightmare situation to be in. And the obvious choice there is to remove people who aren't able to perform individually and bring in talents who perhaps can. And that's what Cloud9 repeatedly showed they would not do. And that Hiko was trying to be involved in, and clearly they, they wanted no part of it. Now listen, now they've done things like that. 
when it's gone completely to shit, when we've had like four or five placings that just aren't acceptable for a team that's getting this much money and should be the best in NA and the, one of the best in the world. Like, in terms of the resources they have now, this is a team which should always be top eight in the world. And we're talking about realistically, if they could get the right players and develop the potential of the team with the right approach and the right mentality, should be battling for a top four spot in the world. That sounds crazy, but battling for it, as in they should be in like the fifth to eighth area. And then, hey, if things go well, you get to like a fifth or sixth position, you have a good placing, you start to creep into the top four. It, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but they should at least be in contention for it. Right now, they aren't even a top 10 team in the world. This is a terrible situation to be in. So leaving was the correct decision because the results were terrible. It wasn't the right good mix of players. They were not willing to have the right philosophy and mentality to remove players. And this is a huge problem. Because think about this. You, when you leave, now you have some say yourself over who you're going to play with, what sort of team it's going to be in terms of the mentality, in terms of the practice, in terms of what shared goals do we have. It's no good. You have all these goals and drives, etc. If players on your team don't, they can hold you back, as we all know who's played in matchmaking or in, or in other games, in solo queue, whatever it might be. Now, by leaving... The option was he was going to leave and try and make the NA super team. He was really just going to go all for broke. He was going to leave the comfort and the luxury and the security of being in Cloud9, where he's a popular player. He's one of the best in the team. He's certainly never going to be the one who gets cut. He's going to make a lot of money. He's going to make all this streaming revenue. He'll always make a lot of money, maybe even money com relative to the European players, but he'll never have the success. So he leaves and dares to go and decide to join. First of all, I bet power if he joined them would have been much less alarm. Obviously, we heard that they'd left that organization. They were going to join a new organization. Now, yes, it, he's obviously going to try and get a good deal in terms of money and the options were out there to definitely get a good deal and money and all the rest of the things that were well, some of the things at Cloud9. But then there's not the security of he's not playing with those players where he's necessarily better than all of them. They might cut him. They might not. Eat, they might turn on him and not even do the deal in the first place. So he'd be left out in the open in the exile having to decide what to do. Then there's the factor of because he's not with these players who he's played with a long time, Maybe it won't even work out personality-wise. He's daring to try it. He's daring to try and overcome the issues that teams like Cloud9 wouldn't, like work with Dazed again, even though he has an abrasive personality. It's going to be difficult to, to overcome, but you're going to try and look at the bigger picture and say, I think I have a better chance to win if I do. Play with players like, okay, Skadoodle and Swag, quite famously fairly quiet players. And listen, if you start losing games and you're losing games because you have bad team play, working with each other, bad communication, that's going to be a problem for you. It's going to annoy you in a sense. It's going to make you think, oh, fuck, I wish I was with those guys who at least communicated properly and I had a good sense of what they were going to do. I can see how that would be a frustration. There were a lot of positive negatives that came along with trying to form the super team, but the upside, the, the ultimate intention and goal was a lot more noble, I think, than people give it credit for. It wasn't like he thought he was better than everyone and he'd fuck everyone and I'm going to go and join this team that's only really skilled players and, you know, like it's a no cloud nines club and we're just going to go to the top. No, it was actually saying, I'm sick of NA just being at, like also runs or the best possible scenario being that we make like a semi of a major and then get instantly knocked out or just get knocked out in the round of eight and be like, oh, if only we'd have won this round and that round. Fuck all that shit. That's bullshit. And I actually respect that Hiko had the balls to say, you know what, I'm going to go for the top. I'm going to go for the absolute best that my region can even offer. I'm going to try and make that happen. Because remember, if he doesn't leave, then hey, who knows what goes on with the iBad power play in days. Remember, they just kicked days out a couple of months before. It's not like he can bring days in a cloud down. They're not open to that. So again, this decision makes sense to try and make that super team. And I actually think, even though we didn't get to ever see it at Alan, that team did have a really good chance. Like, if you ever went back and watched my video before Hiko left Cloud9, I actually listed four of the five players that were in that eventual lineup as being my dream team of if I could put together any team in NA. That's the lineup I would put together. Hiko, Dazed, Swag, Skadoodle. Those are the four I felt had to play together. Not least because they all have diff different styles to a degree. I mean, Swag and Hiko have some overlap, but I think you could make that work. The fifth one I was going to pick was going to be someone like... I might have had someone like Semphis because I actually think... I realise he couldn't actually work along with Days in terms of personality, but I actually think he has some value. And in terms of a supportive player, he can play this role. And we've got enough skill in the other players. I think he could add something extra in the mix there. But okay, they were going to have AZK instead. Whatever. We, we, we That's a wash, maybe. We can we can see how that works out. But obviously, some of those players got themselves banned from the match fixing. So that fucked Hiko completely, even though he put himself out there and everything was going to take place. And he never even got to kind of see the proof of concept by having actually playing a land with them. So now we come to this scenario where an immediate option is obviously rejoin Cloud9. They're having huge problems. They're actually having issues where they brought in Shazam and that's not working out. And hey, maybe they need another good player. And hey, they've worked with Hiko before. I'm sure the option could have been there to rejoin Cloud9. But why would he? Remember the reasons he left. 
terrible mindset, kind of like an old school mindset that doesn't work in a sporting context. In the world of when they were complexity and they didn't make much money and they only went to a few lands and they were never going to win. Okay, I can understand in those circumstances why you might stick with players who aren't performing as well as they should or could, but or maybe are incapable of, but you like their personality and you prefer to play with them and it's more fun to spend time with them than this player who might be a bit of an asshole or someone who just doesn't vibe with you socially. But if you're an actual sporting team now, making thousands of dollars, and the end goal should be to be here, and you have all these fans who believe that you're trying to go towards these goals and become these great players, and you just tell them, oh, yeah, we're practicing hard, and, you know, listen, don't be too hard on my teammate there. You know, he's trying his best. That, that's bullshit to me. You're just selling people a false bill of goods there. Like, it's pretty obvious there's a level of comfort you've just become accustomed to, and you're not even willing to... Th it's, I don't, it's not that I think that they're maliciously doing it. I think they got themselves stuck in a paradigm where all these other players who are unproven are lesser and you'll never try them. And then these other players who are really good and better, it's like, oh, well, I don't like their personality and I don't want to play with them. And eventually you've created a paradigm in which there is no one to choose from. The only, the only choices for Cloud9 in their minds at the time was just this fucking... Sisyphean hell world of doing the same things over and over again and switching X to Y and then Y to X and Z to Y and Z to X and over and over and over and trying the Groundhog Day effect over and over and then wondering why with the same input over and over the output's the same and you're getting the same results and you, it's, it's just insanity. It doesn't make any sense and that must be so incredibly frustrating if you are a player with drive to be one of the best. Especially in Hiko's case, if you've seen your prime as a player when you were comparable to some top Europeans, he wasn't quite on the level of like the great, you know, the shocks, get right, etc. But he was like only one step below. If you've seen that prime come not be able to achieve incre incredible success relative to the Europeans, and then go, your prime go, and your team just go with it and downhill. How fucking depressing is that? Who wants to have a career like that? Unlike the other members, like some of those Cardinal members, he wasn't willing to settle for the bullshit of the comfort and the security, and oh, at least I have a lot of fans, and oh, I guess I have an outside chance to maybe win if everything goes fucking amazingly correctly. And if not, I'll just tell everyone that, you know, we're going to work really hard in the next boot camp and practicing, and you know, actually, Inferno's our map, and we feel like, you know, if things had just gone right on the second round, and we'd actually won this uh, eco hit, like, all the bullshit excuses that get trotted out. Instead of excuses, he actually tried to do something actively in a bunch of these scenarios, leaving Cloud9, after trying to get them to make across the moves, which they wouldn't, trying to make a super team, refusing to just go back to the easy answer of like, oh, well, I guess that didn't work. Just go back to Cloud9, accept all that again. Refusing to do that. These are all separate decisions. Trying to make a new team. Trying to make a team with Skadoodle. Seeing that, of all the players left, Swag's gone. Shroud seems like he's bought into that mentality of the streamer. He's going to be on Cloud9. He's a he's like more of a laid back guy. And he doesn't necessarily have the super fire and drive to be like, oh, I want to be the best. I want to be better than these Europeans. So who's left? Well, we know some of the others are banned. So there's only Skadoodle left, a really talented player, really skilled player who needs the right sort of team around him. So he goes like, right, let's hitch our wagons together. We're the two best. We're not in any teams at the moment, or we have the potential to be the best. And let's just make a new team like we were trying to do before the NA Super Team and pick the right players and make it together. Now, apparently, this is what all the rumors are, he had the chance to do this and it was going to be for Team Liquid, but he'd have to join up with three of their players and bring Skadoodle with him and then make this team but it would be under Team Liquid's. And the notion is, he didn't want to do it under Team Liquid. He wanted to take those players out of Team Liquid, go elsewhere to a new org, a different org, and create a new team. Now, you might ask yourselves, well, again, is this arrogance that you just want to work with Team Liquid, a lesser org? No, here's the thing. That actually makes a lot of sense logically in terms of paradigms of thinking like I described before. If he makes a new team in that manner and they're coming to join him and we're all going to go to a new team, that creates a totally different framework for what this new team is going to be like and the expectations and how it's going to be built. It's not going to be like the old Team Liquid team, but just with some better players and upgrades. It's not going to be like he's joined someone else's team. It's going to be like we're all, as you accepting our thing, going to go and create something new together. And now we're going to start at zero and build it up to be something. And so it's not going to be the case that if one of these two players, Skadoodle or Hiko, doesn't do well, that the others who used to be Team Liquid, their core, are like, right, well, we're obviously a decision-making core, so we're going to kick you out and bring in a different player. You're not going to create a paradigm where that's the possible case. Not only that, but if there's as much money and all the rest elsewhere, why is Team Liquid somehow some special organization that you have to join? They're brand new into CSGO. They've barely been around like five months. They're not some sort of historical thing in CSGO, like NIP, where, you know, they always they have the tradition, the respect, you're trying to go there, and they're always going to have this stability and money and all this. No one knows if Team Liquid will be in CSGO in a year. I'm not saying they won't, but we don't have any proof yet. Not only that, but as a side note, if you look at the history of Team Liquid in terms of their recruiting and their philosophy in StarCraft 2, in 
Dota 2, they're actually a team who were in the same boat as Cloud9, where they would have names that everyone loved and loved to watch stream and had really marketable personalities. But at times, they wouldn't make the hard decisions to cut a player where they could have been more successful or to bring in a player where his personality might not be the greatest, it might be the most marketable even, but it would be better for the team and it would be better for going for the ultimate goal of being the best in the world at your sport and making it a real sport, not making it about marketing personalities like a soap opera or some sort of marketing agency for a boy band or some shit. Like, oh yeah, he's a really cool personality. Don't you love this? Mm, the girls are really related to this guy. So I actually respect, again, sticking with this skadoodle in this sense, but also knowing the bargaining power of we are the two best players. So you're going to join us and we're all going to make a team together. It's going to have this philosophy and this goal and that's going to be from day one on every level. Every aspect of the hierarchy is going to be a this is the goal. We're not joining Team Liquid with its history and we're just going to try and make it a bit better and hope things go really awesome. No, I actually, I actually agree with that. Now, obviously that didn't work out as well. Then how about the European options? So we hear now about this European super team. Not really a super team because some of the players aren't super in that sense. They're not superstars. Some of them are not even bordering on stars. Some of them are stars, okay? Now the issue here is, obviously, that's very rocky. I mean, that still hasn't even come about without Hiko. We still don't know how, what the logistics of that would be. Where would they live? What team would they play for? How would it all work? He doesn't even know any of those players on like a deep personal level. So they could easily just decide, right, well, it's too much hassle to have him. Let's get another European in. There's a lot of uncertainty there. So I, I can understand kind of being a bit hesitant on that if there are any options. Now then, Hiko actually said in a, in a, in a comment on Gosu Gamers, he said, right now, I can't really be picky anymore. If the players are up to par or not, doesn't matter to me. I want a team with the hunger with a hunger to win. That's what I'm looking for right now. So now here's the interesting thing. After he's pursued all his options and he's kept at the times when his stock value, his trade value is high, he's tried to get the best possible scenario to get a really good NA team of the best place he can get and then become the best NA team and, the, and a really great European team with the right mentality and practice approach. Now that that's not possible, it's not that he's too arrogant. He's like, right, well, in that case, I quit the game. I'll never play again. You know, I'm... I'm like Jordan when he quit in his prime. I'm like, I'm done with this game. And if it's not right circumstances, I'm going to leave the game. And I'm, I'm not going to play anymore. I'll never see myself degraded. No, that's not the case. Now that he really has seen that these options can't happen and the correct decisions, unfortunately, haven't yielded the right results for other reasons, now he is willing to join a team. And now he's looking for the right sort of team where at least, it, listen, if he can't get the skill of the players right now and he can't get the right teammates where it's the right philosophy, all other things, at least the drive is there. Remember, that was the main reason to leave Cloud9 in the first place. There has to be a real hunger to win. And even if it's a lesser player, if he has the real drive and he's going to put everything into it and we're going to play the right way. And as a result, maybe even philosophy of who we recruit is the right sense of if we get a chance to get a better player, we're going to do it. Even if this guy's our buddy, but he's not that good. And oh, I hope he works out. There's none of that shit. As long as that's still there, at least that's something that is Hiko's driving motivation. That is, there's something noble about that. There's something respectable about having that as your impulse in a sport to try and be the best you can be and to be the best you can be in your region and make your region better. There's something to that, I think. Now, why people don't like it? Well, like I said, this, these are people's lives and careers here. This isn't a soap opera. The fact that you think, ah, oh, he, should, he should go with him and I think that would be a cool story. Who gives a fuck? I don't, I don't care what you think about that sense. You haven't even given any merits there for why the person would join that. And then usually when people do, it's the most harebrained level of soap opera storylines of like, well, you should stop hating him and do this. And I, I saw some demos where that guy was quite good. So I think he could be better. And if you just wait, maybe don't be arrogant and his potential might get reached seven times over. All these harebrained logic that doesn't make any sense to actual pro players who are thinking like actual sportsmen and professionals. You've got to respect the guy who has the courage to want to win and do whatever it might take to win. When people like some of the Cloud9 players would tell you, now listen, we're doing everything we can to win. and Our goal is to be the best and to win. And obviously we don't want to lose. Well, you do in a sense, because what you actually, there's always a distinction to be made, right? Between the guys who say, I'll do anything to win and the guys who won't do the things that are taken to win. What that tells you is even if they're telling you I'll do anything to win, in reality, their actions speak louder than their words. And you could actually change what they're saying to be more realistic with square brackets to put I'll do and then square brackets anything within my own comfort zone of what I think I should do and would like to do close brackets to win. Now, that's not very sexy as a comment, is it? It's not very interesting. It's not very respectable. It's like, OK, I mean, I guess if you want to do that, but there's not really any reason for me to get hyped about that. But if they said that, that'd actually be more accurate. I respect the guy where he, where if he says, I'll do anything to win, he really means that. He means he'll play with a guy who, 
maybe doesn't respect him, doesn't like him, but he knows that they have a chance to be better and that maybe they can synergize in the game, even if there's people, they don't work well together. I mean, there's some, uh, there's some great cases I could tell you about in history or in sports where players did not get along, but they were fucking amazing inside the game and they didn't have to like each other and they didn't like each other, but it didn't matter. The, the players in game worked much better. Meanwhile, I can tell you cases where the players weren't that good in game, but they had awesome personalities and they got along great and they were friends. But yeah, in general, I mean, I'll get in on other videos to the actual logistics of people joining Cloud9 and people joining CLG and who should do that. I've still got that big video coming up. I'm still working because I want to I do it right, okay? But in this particular case, from my analysis, from my judgments, Hiko's been right in most of these cases. Yes, he's had some bad luck in some of them, some circumstances that were beyond his control. And there were certain times where if you know what you know later, maybe you would have made a different decision. But on each individual in isolation, judged separately, I think the majority of these decisions, the reasoning or his intention behind why he made the decision to me was the right one or was what I like to see from a player and is the approach I want to see and is a respectable approach and one that shouldn't just be treated with this contempt of people tarring someone in a certain way of like, oh, you're too arrogant, you're above us and all the rest of it. Like, you're just wrong in that particular sense.